<laughs> you and your funny faces. <laughs> I'm causing difficulties at the start Distress. of the podcast. It's already hard again. enough to come up with an original way to launch a podcast. Why should it be seen. original? I don't know. My mind just gets blocked if I think, oh, you've said that too many times. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm John. I'm Andrea. This is Voices in the Dark. We are learning how to human, and this is the next episode in our um, popular and provocative, we hope, <laughs> sex and relationship series. Episodes that I think have produced the, the biggest amount of discussion and feedback um, of all the ones we've done, like for individual episodes anyway, which is definitely pretty heartening. Um, and we wanted to do another one. We don't have a, a guest in on this one, though it might be a subject to come back to in the future. But this is about consent and what it is and how it works, how it doesn't work. And so let's start with a disclaimer. <laughs> Cause the, cause, <laughs> we probably need one for this yeah, one. Yeah, this, this is a very tricky uh, subject to talk about because a lot of people um, will, have, will have had quite profoundly difficult, hurtful, damaging, confusing experiences surrounding sex and consent. Uh, and nothing that we're going to say if we take one view or that view, we're not saying that's simply true. We're simply saying that that's our, our thoughts on it, our ideas about it, and we hope that by more talk, by having more conversations about consent, we can try to understand better what it is, because so much of the problem, I think, comes down to the breakdown in communications. So if you don't like what we say, or you do like what we say, or you think we're missing the point or whatever, um, we want to hear from you and continue the discussion. Um, this is not just us saying we got the answers and you can get in touch in a variety of ways to do that uh, on our Facebook group. You can go to facebook.com slash V in the D and click over to the group or you can message us there, voicesinthedark.world. You can get in touch that way um, on Instagram. Um, don't send us horrible pornographic images on Instagram <laughs> at V in the D dot pod. You know, it's very suspicious when it's like this person you don't know has sent you an image tap to view and you're like, Okay, what is it going to be? Mm -hmm. it? Oh, it's a dick. What a surprise. I can't say that I've gotten that many dick pics. But then I, it's effectively like I consented to seeing the dick. But I didn't know it was going to be a dick. How confusing. Mm -hmm. And a brilliant way to start. So do you, ha do you have any like overarching introductory thoughts? Just that it's one of those things that has become a very heated and sort of bandied about issue mm. um, as we are experiencing sort of a what is appropriate revolution. Um, things have always tended to trend towards the being slightly less of a cunt than we were the generation before. But in modern times that has gone from let's not be cunts to let's make sure no one is ever a cunt ever to anyone or in a way that could be found to be a bad thing by anyone ever even if that person might like it no one else might and therefore we should like it's become a weird police state version of let's try to make the world better which inevitably makes the world worse yeah when things are totalizing it's how is that going to work for, for given the variety of different people and desires and circumstances and ideas and what to one person can seem like uh, a super exciting fantasy to another person can seem like a horrible damaging assault yeah. it's always interesting that by and large it's people not affected by something directly that tend to be the loudest protesters of that thing. I mean, obviously there's a caveats and exceptions, but like, for example, with race relations, the people that get most offended by someone saying something inappropriate towards black people tend to be uh, white, mm -hmm. liberal, sort of social justice warrior people. Not saying that black people wouldn't be upset or something racist, but it seems to be that the loudest policing voices. The loudest policing voices are not the ones directly affected by it, hmm. which is a not dynamic, and it's always confused me, but it interested me. I find it very amusing when uh, straight people have said to me that I shouldn't use gay as a derogatory word. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> That's an example. I'm like, guys, okay, it's interesting that it really matters to you in this way, but 
you're not in any way like if we were to understand using like say oh that's gay when you mean it's shit i do this in a very like it the joke for me is the fact i am gay and i'm calling it gay so it's totally silly it's just being yeah. silly and if you're in no cons no possible way the victim of this thing if there is going to be a victim then what the fuck are you up to? Are you, you're basically saying that other people who might be offended, you, it's your mission to go about protecting their possible feelings when really you're arrogantly assuming that you know how other people are going to feel. Yeah, and there's, a, I mean, another example that always made me kind of confused is, for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger got in trouble for calling um, people girly men. <laughs> and the other the backlash was that that was a misogynistic thing to say, blah, blah, blah. And well, you know, men aren't meant to be in theory, socially by the majority perspective, girly. Calling them girly men is effective as an insult because most men want, don't want to be girly. They want to be men, men. Mm -hmm. the, the point is to insult people. Well, yeah, <laughs> that was the whole point. That was the point. Whereas, you know, if he went up to a five year old girl and said, you're a little girl, mm -hmm. it's not an insult. But if you go up to an 800 pound power lifter and go, you're such a little girl, because, <laughs> you know, he, he cried after stubbing his toe. Yeah. Is it inappropriate to call him a little girl like i mean it's not very nice it's not very nice and oh you're you're making the assumption that little girls aren't tough and all these kinds of things like it's meant to make someone feel slightly diminished and uncomfortable perhaps jokingly perhaps it's like to hurt them and as that it served its purpose it's not a commentary on whether little girls are good or bad overall in the world and whether saying saying that you saying that you're something when you're not that thing it doesn't have to be playing on like uh gender roles or whatever right. you're like saying you're a poo like no i'm not yes you are you know this is like basic kid stuff you're calling someone something that's kind of negative or even if you're just like hey you're a table you're like i'm not i'm not a table i'm a huge you're a table it's kind of uncomfortable yeah. just to be confronted by, by being called something that you don't think you are. And there's, uh, the, another example of that is the uh, usage of words meant to refer medically to disabled people of some kind as an insult. Mm -hmm. And there's a comedian that has a routine about how at first, like people that were sort of mentally retarded were called something like imbeciles or deficient or something. And we started using that as an insult. Mm. So then the medical community came up with the word retarded mm -hmm. to differentiate as between slowed. Yeah. It was a medical term, which mm. is now the one that's considered inappropriate because guess what happens? Because the moment one of our mates does something stupid, like completely retarded, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to make fun of them, an able bodied person, by likening them to someone who can't help being mentally deficient in some way and it doesn't matter how many times you rename the medical term people will make all their mates the problem is not the language it's the intent yes i think very much and whilst language can gain a ton of weight associated with it over time which is important and is important to consider on a case-by-case -case basis the words themselves are just vessels for the thing that we're trying to communicate um so like i could i can call you uh, a fucking cocksucker but I'm doing it and I'm kind of smiling different to if a very aggressive person who really has, has it in for you calls you that very different reaction, very different intention and yeah. so on. But anyway, context is intention king. and yeah, language. It's, 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 there's so much, so many layers to this, which is what people forget. Things are relative and they're dependent on just the whole background, something that might be offensive when said by a particular person to another particular mm. person breaks down the moment you switch either of the two people, both of them, or, you know, in a different context, it's not the same, which is why, for example, a comedian in general, you should assume positive intent from a comedian making a joke in the sense that he's trying to get a laugh. Maybe the joke isn't funny, but he doesn't genuinely have a racist view if he's making a joke about it on stage as a comedian. It's very unlikely <laughs> that they'll be trying to bend, you know, to rally together the whites. From the comedy club. From a comedy club. It's 
they're trying to make a joke. And maybe it's a bad joke or in poor taste, so don't laugh. But don't assume that they're racist and get angry and write an angry letter. Just go, eh, this guy didn't know what to say at the appropriate time. He thinks it's funny. He's not. Mm. Which for a, a comedian is probably all the more crushing. Um, so yes, language and context are, are, are the most important things, I think, in trying to talk about these things and understand what they, they mean. And in the context of like sexual consent, I think there's so much, so much of what we're going to get into here comes down to realizing that communication goes beyond specific words, goes beyond even words at all. And this is why it's complicated. So it's not like we're going to come out the other end of this discussion with super clear answers. The point is to try and understand where some things go wrong and hopefully see different sides that maybe we've not experienced. Or I'm going to share some personal experiences where I have found myself on like the the, the side of, of consent where you don't want to be, I suppose. Um, so we'll get into that. But the I think the like the, the well-known slogans like just say no and the no means no. It doesn't, well, yeah, okay, no generally means no unless someone's like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't give us enough of a full picture of how to deal with many real-life situations where saying no is extremely difficult. Um, on the other hand, there's been this big backlash we were just talking about in some quarters, which I think this super policing mentality that goes so far that it could take it takes so much of the spontaneity fun and mystery out of sex which are some of the exciting parts of not knowing where it's going of being a little bit like oh am i really going to do this do i really want to do this it's those can those can be like complex emotions which i experience more in a state of like playful exploration rather than oh my god this is very dangerous right now again depends on the situation um I think it's really weird on American campuses. I've heard they're now like uh, introduced these apps like consent apps. It's like you put your digital signature on this thing before you before you fuck, because otherwise there may be someone regretting that they had sex, for example. Um, and claiming that they hadn't consented to it later. Yeah. And so that's sort of a defensive thing against the, uh, the, the like the fear in response to the fear that you're going to be called a rapist if somebody uh, decides that they they didn't they, that it was a mistake, and there was this crazy the crazy case Joe Rogan spoken about a lot. Um, I forget the name of the the college uh, in America where this like girl and guy had sex. They and the girl later claimed that it was it was assault, but they look back and you have the text message records. Um, and she's like texting her friends saying, oh, hey, I'm going to, yeah, probably going to sleep with this guy. Um, and she like message him and, and says, oh, have you got some condoms? And he goes around whatever happens between them so that they have sex. But the nature of it and what happened, obviously, is only those two know. Later, she says, like, it, it wasn't consensual. I was drunk. He gets thrown out of the college. I think he was suing them, maybe successfully. But he's effectively like put on trial for this, even though he was drunk too. Like, so you can only be consenting whilst drunk if you're male, mm -hmm. is the message out of this. Whereas a woman is always being raped if she's drunk. Well, you know, like, even though it's becoming less of a thing by degrees, people, most people still think that a man can't be raped. Well, I beg to differ. By a woman. I mean, they know that they can be raped by a man. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, you can certainly be raped by a woman. Like, a part yeah, of the... Can. Part of the, the... I have these notes here, but I don't think they're going to follow in the order that, that the conversation is going. So to get into that directly, one of the hardest things to do, I think, when in, you're in the sexual scenario is just to be able to say no. Sounds simple, isn't. Um, so an example for, let's just like get into like the very clear no situation. Um, I have been out at a club in Moscow, so not the best gay place to be. Um, yeah, not, not, not the safest gay scene. Yeah, and I was kind of, uh, 
I was definitely full of a lot of sexual energy and there was a, a couple of guys that I thought were very hot and we were sort of getting closer, talking a little bit. Um, and I kind of really wanted to go, okay, let's stop being so repressed in myself. Let's just go with this moment. Wouldn't it be great to just get it on with these guys? And like we, we leave the club and um, I won't go into the intense detail because it's still pretty upsetting to do so. But it became clear that one of the guys was ex a nasty, aggressive, mean person who like took me into like, or we all three went into uh, this other bar, orders drinks and then makes me pay for it. Like I haven't got any money. Um, and is very humiliating, um, keeps like shoving his hands down my pants, which at first seemed like quite exciting and provocative, but increasingly isn't where he likes sticks his finger in my ass and then keeps shoving the finger under my nose in my face. It's like really degrading, really like, what is this? This is a power game of some sort. It's fucking weird. Yeah, it is fucking weird. And rapidly I'm just in the, the situation of like, okay, I'm still kind of wanting this to be the hot thing I imagined it to be, but it's not. And now I'm outside and there's only me and these two guides in a kind of deserted courtyard area one of them is holding on to me and the other one is shoving this finger in my face and is starting to tear my shirt off because I'm saying, I want to leave, this is over. Yeah. And as this is happening, at a certain point, like I, I just eventually snap out of fear and throw the world's most useless punch and then like uh, run after him and like he ju jumps down some stairs and I like jump on him and kick him to try and l literally immobilize him so I can escape. That was a great recovery day the next day. I could barely walk from all of this. Um, but in those moments of like the shirt tearing of this, I'm in this weird in-between zone where I can't believe it's happening. It's not as simple as I can look back now and go, I should have just said, no, fuck off. It was this weird dreamlike state of, how can this be happening to me? Is this really, this must be a mistake. I must be misunderstanding something because how could it be that it really is heading in a direction where it looks like he wants to violently assault me and rape me? And that sense of weird twilight zone disbelief, in a way I'm kind of grateful to have experienced it so that at least I have some insight into what people say who have been raped. And then when people say things like, why didn't you just say no or whatever? Like, well, because you can barely fucking believe it's happening. Yeah. And then you, you fear, like, we're like, well, it's too late. There's this weird concept in our minds of like, oh, it's too late now. Mm. I mm -hmm. should have said no, and I didn't. I missed the opportunity. Yeah, it's like, but you can always change your mind. Mm. You can always change your mind. It might be inconsiderate you can't to suddenly your... say no three seconds before the other person's about to come, and you've, yeah. done, you've got yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's still technically in your prerogative, like to be able to like, just say, you know what, I'm not feeling this anymore. You can't change your mind afterwards either. Yeah. That's, that's just regretting an action and thinking, hey, I did, a, I did a silly thing and I wish I hadn't. And most people are foolish and not very aware. So it is possible that they're not aware that they're raping you. <laughs> It is certainly something like unless you've actually made it un understood, they might not know. Hmm. Now, this guy doesn't sound like he didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. But maybe he thought that was really sort of hot, dirty slash aggressive sex play that he's into. And most other people that he did it to were fine with it. Maybe. And, you know, it's only after someone says, you know what, this isn't cool. And then maybe he sits down and goes, hmm. I, I doubt it. In this particular case, it sounds like an asshole. Yeah, and I, I hope that he has been hit by a car and died of seriously painful injuries. <laughs> but <laughs> non-consensually. Non-consensually. But you're, I think you're bang on the, on this broader point that. So I, I've said on one side, it's hard to say no. I'm going to talk about that more in another context. But on the other side too, it can be quite difficult to know. For sure, if somebody is not into something, I mean, usually it is quite obvious people, let, let, let's be fair. Like if someone's not really into the, the initiation of like some kissing, some touching, you can kind of feel it. 
I would think. On the other hand, some people are just really nervous and they kind of want it to happen, but they're not yeah. sure. It's awkward. Yeah. And there are some people that are so preloaded with their father's social come. shame. <laughs> No, like they're not meant to want it, supposedly, right. by society or their religion or something like that. So if they were accepting of it like they want to be, internally, it's too much conflict. Mm. They want it, but they have to think or appear to not want it and be won over and conquered because then it's not their fault, even though they wanted it deep down. And that's a very hard thing to negotiate. Like, I would say avoid those people if you can. It's definitely difficult. And like that's a stereotype associated with women, but it's definitely a thing among uh, uh, men, certainly a lot, of, a lot of gay men who adopt those, like, you have to come, like, win me, the, the person in the tower. You have to climb up and show your, your metal. And, but, and then it becomes this, like, really tedious game of putting in a lot of effort to get somebody to allow themselves to do the thing they want to do. Where it's almost like you're having to sit down and have an argument with them to say, yeah, but you know, you, you really, you really like cake. You know, I can see that you want some cake. And they're like, no, I don't want cake. No, I'm not that kind of guy. I don't want the cake. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, well, it's okay. You don't have to have the cake. Like, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not forcing you to have the cake. If you don't want cake, that's fine. Just say that you don't want cake. Well, you know, maybe I'd like some cake. What, I don't, did you want, the cake is here. <laughs> Would you like some cake? It's like, oh, no, I really want, want you to like value me as a, as a person, an individual. I'm like, I'm having a great time. I'm having a lot of fun time um, with you right now. Like I've made my position clear. It'd be fun to like have a little cake together. We don't have to. We don't have to. This is cool. But, you know, I think cake would be quite fun. Would you like some cake? <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> ah! <laughs> and it goes round and round and round. And I've been caught in these situ situations. And it's, it's so weird because it, it feels potentially a, a bit rapey. And that's in no way a position I want to be in. And yet simultaneously, I'm like, no, you really are wanting me to try and get you to a place where you want this. Yeah, and I would, but it's such a turn off too. It is, it is. It's, it's a weird thing, and it's it's like we should aim to remove that from society by being as open and liberal about sex as we can, teaching our children that it's normal, it's fine, and, and yeah. so that they don't have internalized weirdness like that that then makes it confusing for people mm. to figure out whether or not someone's consenting and then it formed maybe maybe they, maybe they're young as well and so that their idea of what is acceptable is informed by how the other person reacts mm -hmm. and if they if their first 20 sexual experiences are okay you have to put in about an hour's worth of work of touching and groping until they finally say yes by the time they're 30 they're not going to think that that's a problem mm -hmm. and when they encounter someone that actually thinks like what are you doing they'll be confused as to why they think that's rape. It, it's, yeah. it, it keeps reinforcing itself because we taboo sex, normal sex. Yeah. And it's, it's so, so wrong for then the burden of setting the boundary and saying this isn't okay to put the burden of that on somebody who's currently being uh, misused or pushed or cajoled by the other person. So I'm saying but it, you can't say that the people who are having these unwelcome advances, it's down to them in those strange, weird moments to be like, no, this isn't acceptable. The responsibility is on our wider society to talk more freely and openly about sex and not feel like it's something where we just, our mouth clamps shut, we don't want to talk about that. The only kind of sex is the kind that we see um, in TV shows, in the movies, where everything is totally clear. Well, it depends yeah. what movies you watch. But. There's so many little things that if talked about early and openly could really, really help. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, most people, I would say, I could be wrong here, but most people don't know that uh, some women orgasm during rape. Women aren't told this. And pretty much all women that do end up feeling ashamed because they feel like they must have wanted it deep down. Mm. Whereas it's a physiological response. Just like when you touch a guy 
he might get an erection even if he doesn't want to have sex. Yes. Which and, is part of how but we're not told be like because it's so uh, it seems inappropriate or seedy or shameful. We don't talk about it, and then it happens to people, and they don't have a frame of reference. Going shit, I wish that hadn't happened, but it's something mm -hmm. that could happen, and it has happened to me. And it is very hard not to feel like you're you're to blame for ending up in that. That's how I felt when I got some counselling after this Moscow incident. That I didn't think that these guys had acted appropriately at all, but I also blame for myself for putting myself in that position. And, and yet like the damage of that, that follows through, I, I kind of recognized it a bit more, uh, recently. I didn't realize I was carrying so much of that with me, but I think that I, I, I was or am that I associated it with the impulse to be like, Hey, I'm just going to be a bit like unleash, the beast here let's just be sexually adventurous and spontaneous and yeah sometimes i do want the kind of sex which is like hey these two random guys seem hot let's get it on and to explore that aspect of my sexuality and i come to connect that with fear like and to repress the fact that that is part of my sexuality and to think no if you actually let yourself out of the box out of the bottle you're going to get hurt I mean, okay, that can be a genuine risk, but this was more like encoded from that traumatic experience. Right. So when I was more recently in uh, a gay sauna, um, which I think we'll talk about more in another episode, very interesting place, I, I got quite a lot of good practice in saying no, because, well, two things, good practice in saying no, but the other thing, finding my feeling safe enough and supported enough as I was there with my boyfriend to be able to say yeah I do want to just have some random spontaneous experiences to feel like a slutty boy and that not to feel bad but to feel like hey this is cool and expressive on the saying no front it's a challenge in particular because somebody like coming on to you, just chatting you up, or somebody like with a creeping hand up the leg. This isn't a gay sauna, so this is hardly like totally inappropriate conduct. This is like normal. Mm. And I, I came to learn that like a fairly firm like removal of the hand is fine and isn't taken like as a, a, a big insult, I guess. But at first I'm thinking, I wanna say no, but this person seems fine, you know, we're sort of chatting. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to say, no, I don't find you attractive, or I just felt this sort of odd tension building combined with my own repressive dynamic going, are you just, why don't you just let yourself go? Why don't you just do it? And the other part of me going, I, I just don't think I'm into this guy though. I just don't <laughs> think I'm, and it's becoming like a, a battle of weird principles and wanting to be things in the mind. Yeah. And then like, the hand has come quite a long way up my leg at this point. And I'm like, isn't it too late to say like, if I didn't, I should have said before. Yeah, which is weird. You, you, it's one of those situations where we wouldn't do it for any other thing that could be analogued to that. Mm -hmm. You go to a restaurant, you're eating a nice salad, you take a few mouthfuls, think this is good, I want to have some more. You put a little weird thing in your mouth that you think, oh, I wonder what this is. And it's super bitter and disgusting. Mm -hmm. You don't go, oh, it's in my mouth now. I'm going to keep chewing <laughs> and swallow it oh. because the salad might get offended. <laughs> No, you spit it out. You think, what the fuck is this? Well, the, the salad isn't a human, but... No, but you should have an, almost the same kind of level of detachment to another person's feelings when it comes to your own comfort and safety. Mm -hmm. Fuck them. Fuck their feelings. If you're uncomfortable or if you feel unsafe, you have no obligation to their feelings. You, you don't have an obligation. That's true. I, I don't want to go as far as like, fuck them, get lost. <laughs> Fucking them is the issue here. Um, but more to be able to say like, hey, like as what I got to was just like, like, yeah, I don't think I really want that. Thanks. Yeah. Like I'm enjoying talking to you, but I, I'm not feeling right? it. Like you should be able to use the polite version. But mm -hmm. the minute that that is pushed up against, you don't you don't have to gradually escalate from hmm. oh, no, 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 all the way to finally two hours later going, I didn't want that at all. Mm -hmm. You test the waters. One of the things you can do, actually, that will, in most cases, unless the person's an idiot, 
make them understand something's wrong is become rigid and mm. slightly and push slightly off. If a person isn't an, an idiot, they will recognize something wrong and they will suddenly stop and pull back and then you just go, I don't feel comfortable, no thank you, or something like that. Mm. But once it gets, like, it's sort of like a weird situation where having to use actual language, it's not that it has to be a last resort, but there's so much more communication of I don't want this that can happen before that. And conversely, communication of I do want this which is like the other side of consent where do they ever say, yes, I want you to fuck me? Like, well, maybe not, but maybe they, they really didn't need to. Yeah, when they bent over and spread their cheeks, <laughs> you know, and lustily looked back straight into my eyes. Yeah, then <laughs> I wasn't sure if they wanted but, but it. But for some not. people, for some people, <laughs> it's such a black and white issue that that still doesn't count. You know, even if it's not the iPhone app fingerprint registered commitment, uh, or a signed thing unless there's an actual yes it's not enough and there's this like weird um trend that uh, I've, I've i've read about and in fact i think i know a couple of people who've gone down this route and and i think it's probably killing a lot of what could be fun sex for them is that everything that you you want to do you ask permission like would like would you like it if i caressed your breasts would you like it if i sucked your dick a bit harder would you like it if and Sorry, yeah, just like, bo I'm bored. Yeah. I'm bored. Like if you, it's, it's certainly people, some people struggle with the confidence and I have before the confidence to say, Hey, yeah, I'm not enjoying that. Like, don't do it that way. Or like, I don't, I don't want, I don't want you going there right now or something. And even with the confidence of saying, I really like it. If, that's one of the most exciting things, I think, in, in the bedroom or wherever you're having sex, mm -hmm. um, is when someone says, I really love it if you do this. And you're like, fantastic. The keys to the kingdom. I want you to, I want you to be having a great time. And now you've given yeah. me like the treasure map to, to that for you. Fantastic. And yet so many, like the, the less experienced people or less confident people, it's like having sex with a ghost. Like they, they they want it, they're there, but they're not talking, they're not mm -hmm. communicating even really at a physical level. So my advice is have a lot of sex and have it super young. <laughs> <laughs> well, Can generally the people that are most comfortable are the ones that have had the most experiences. So they, they've had experiences which was good for them and shit for the other person. And eventually they figured that out. They had shit experiences and they figured why that was. They figured out in themselves what they like. They've grown up and kind of hopefully outgrown some of the insecurities mm -hmm. they used to have. And by the time you're 60, you know what kind of sex you want, but it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I think that like having the variety of experience without expecting that sex is always going to be or always has to be amazing that it can really help to have that that frame of reference. And if once you go, get past the hurdle of like, oh, you're still a virgin, that really can weigh heavily on someone's mind. And you turn sex into this huge thing that's never going to be as good or as bad as you think it might be. And for like a, a few guys who told stories I've heard about how like losing their virginity at like 14 or 15, they're so much more comfortable. These are straight guys comfortable around women. They're not frightened by women because they didn't build up this like cumulative resentment out of a sense of I want something and I can't get it. So I'm going to blame women. Yeah. Sexual frustration is the source of so much internalized anger that results in antisocial or difficulty in later uh, adulthood uh, for men. Mm. Um, and I, I believe that online pornography has gone a long way towards uh, sort of solving that actually, funnily enough. That's one other topic for another yeah. episode. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd go even further and think, I think it would be really good if it was uh, sort of culturally acceptable, not mandatory, but you're, you're, I don't know how women would feel about this, so I'd say like, I think this is probably true for a lot of guys at least, um, The you get initiated by essentially a prostitute like hopefully a kind, caring person. I mean, not obligatory. But... Yeah, not obligatory, <laughs> but like professional. Yeah. So you go there, you're not, you're made to feel comfortable. This is a pro professional person who's part of their, their job and their, what, their craft really 
is helping somebody feel comfortable and enjoy themselves and learn to let go and experience something. They can explain some things and show some things in a way that like porn or stories isn't going to work for you. And then you can get by that little mental hump that society places in front of you about, oh, I haven't lost my virginity. It's not going to be the most amazing sex of your life, I hope. It's not going to be that that's the same as like having a deep emotional connection with someone. But I think certainly for a lot of guys, just the act becomes this obsession that starts hanging around your neck if you haven't had it. Yeah. And to at least have an experience where it's not confused, fumbling and regret in the morning compared to like going, going to the spa or having a, a massage. So if it was socially acceptable to get sex whenever you wanted legally through prostitution if if that was completely okay it was fully legal and not socially stigmatized then it would change sexual dynamics by making guys not only want one thing Mm. because they can get that thing without you Mm. you know at that point at least i don't know if it would impact uh, homosexual relationships as much but then you'd probably know that a guy pursuing you finds you interesting (laughs) And therefore, you don't have to put up weird obstacles to make sure that he does before you have sex with him. You can be more liberated about having sex with him. Maybe you have sex earlier and, you know, there's less tension, less awkwardness. It could sort of evolve human uh, interaction past weird obstacles that are no longer necessary. Yes, this is this. You you hetero people are seriously fucked up. (laughs) Like... I'm not saying there aren't a lot of problems in gay land, because there certainly are. Is that a land? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a pass. <laughs> Can I visit the? <laughs> oh wait, like what happened? Like, well, what's the implications if I visit though? <laughs> like, you're do you going on to... a few rides, <laughs> 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 and it's going to get wet. Oh Jesus! And it's not a height limit. There's, it's a different kind of uh, measurement that's required. <laughs> anyway, um, so out of like. Uh, out of some curiosity and interest, um, me and my my boyfriend has put like sea girls on Tinder. What a horrifying situation that is. And I'm, and this is not me saying women are horrible before anyone takes that out of context. But it was so striking how there must be so much sort of pressure and copycat self-representation going on that I, I literally couldn't tell many of these women apart. Now, I can tell women apart in person and on yeah. the street, but in, in Tinder, it's not like, oh, they all look the same to me. Yeah. It's not that, but the weird filters, the sort of taken from above, pouty selfie, I'm the festival girl, oh, I'm, I'm the girl who's about to go on a night out, but I'm currently at home with a nice glass of red wine with my babes. I'm like, what is this? And then when I got... I can't say it's going well. I've had one match. <laughs> I'm being very picky. Um, I thought, okay, let's strike up a conversation and in the way that I normally would on a dating app um, and just kind of try and be a bit funny, a bit chatty. And the dynamic was so achingly immediately obvious that it was a, you have to impress me. Mm. I have the goals. You have to impress me. Now dance for me, little man, and I'm going to make it as hard for you as possible. And I'm like, fuck yourself. <laughs> like, what? that's so weird to me compared to the sort of human interaction that I would want with anyone, which would be, hey, you know, oh, what's up? And then you find ways to sort of chat and be funny and be playful, see if you have a sort of similar sense of humor or not. It's not meant to be a trial. Well, it's often like that because mm. ultimately in modern society, uh, women are the gatekeepers of sex and men want sex and they'll jump through hoops to get there. <sighs> and so it, it sets up, up a weird dynamic, which is self-reinforcing as well. But that doesn't make women powerful. It does seem that way in that moment. It's that society is telling you that you that women have to behave a certain way or we're going to call you sluts. And therefore you lose social respect, you become less desirable um, according to like various people's views. Um, instead of being able to just be in a dynamic of like almost everyone wants sex, enjoys sex and think how much better it could just be if we could kind of admit to that. Yeah. It's definitely like the, the, 
like the female friends of mine who prepare to go, you know, I just really need some D right now. I'm mm-hmm. like, hey, you're, you're a real person. You know, you're actually, t- you're actually telling me the truth here. And there's no need to be hiding and pretending that it has to be a little princess complex. No. I mean, I've fallen into this sort of th- that trap with uh, pretty boys where a friend of mine classically said, I think your problem is that you just always seem to want to fall for, um, <laughs> for, for um, pretty boys with daddy issues, ordering them from neuroticfaggots.com, insisting they come with a princess complex. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. I think I'm getting past that. But it's true. And this is going to sound weird and it's purely speculative based on my personal experience. But those particular boys who acted in that way of this like, chase me, chase me. Oh, no. Oh, no. you got to work for it. you got to work for it because I'm such a pro- I'm like, you, you were on Grindr. You said you, you said you wanted to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> and now this is like, oh, no, next time, next time. Even though there's no hint of this possibly being a sort of relationship. It's yeah, like, like I mean, if hand. I wanted to be coldly rejected, I would go to a bar. Yeah. Why, why are you on Tinder? Like, <laughs> <laughs> reject. Swipe, you know, <laughs> swipe, swipe left if you're just here for hookups. I'm not just here for hookups, but I'd like that to be a possibility for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think this is? <laughs> Why, why is everyone such a dick on Grindr? Um, so the, the, the strange observation was these guys seem to be um, brought up in families where either there's no father figure or it's like predominantly sisters and a mother. And my, my like haphazard non-scientific guess is that they've been like brought up in that same culture of this is how we think about sex. This is what a man should and shouldn't be, you know, with men being the, the other in this situation. You're going to remember that the way we treat potential mates is generally a learned copied behavior from how our parents treat the opposite sex. Mm. And I'm assuming a young gay man isn't going to look at how his father treats men and copy that. No. <laughs> He's going to look at how his mother treats women and internalize and copy that mm-hmm. in the future. So if she's protective of herself and, you know, the, that kind of thing, or uh, also projecting me, if, if, if you're right, the more sister there is and the more they're protected from mm-hmm. dirty men, the more that that's going to be a relevant behavior as well. So you might be right. Who knows? I don't know. It was an interesting thought. Um, I think that the best sexual experiences I've had have been where both me and the other guy, because it's not like I've always like acted the best or not been weird or anything like that. Um, when me and the other guy have just been like, hey, you know, th- this is cool. Should we like, like grab a coffee, have a fun conversation? Yeah, yeah, we're pre- it's pretty cool. You know, we're really into each other. Should we go have sex? Yeah, let's go do it. Oh, sex is cool, isn't it? Let's do this and this and this. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's really fun. And then afterwards, you're just like, fuck, yeah, I had a good time. I had a good time. I had a fun time with you. Thanks. This is cool. Like, yeah, maybe drop your line. You know, it's not, it's not like that. That's not saying that's better sex than the sex that I have in my relationship. <laughs> but if we're talking about like the the first like connection right. hookup type thing. That's the best when no one's sort of pretending that they have to be like, I am an irres- I'm a respectable figure in society and I have to do it this way or that way. Mm. It's peculiar. It's, so, it's like it is. It's like actually ha- having sex with adults when you can be at the mm. level of like... Well, there's so many weird little things that can affect it as well and differently from men and women. I mean, women, biologically speaking, have a use-by date, unfortunately. Um, so there's a certain pressure to get it right to use them <laughs> no, on their part, mm-hmm. even in subconsciously, you know, they, they bark the wrong train too many times and they won't be able to have children. Now that doesn't need to be an active thought. It can be a biological imprint of behavior mm-hmm. that selects for being picky to make sure you don't fuck it up. But there's also then the social con- overarching construct of having been in, in societies in which that's the case for so long mm. that we've imposed it on ourselves with extra dogmatic behaviors that are not due to biology, but purely because we teach our children that it's shameful or wrong or like that. Yeah. And then there's other things like I, I feel like we might become less sexually spontaneous the more we become wage slaves. Mm-hmm. I think there was a co- there's no co- coincidence in my mind 
that the 60s, the free 60s and 70s kind of revolution of sex was coinciding with sort of the, the, the partial winning of the war on, you know, being a slave to your job. There was more free leisure time, mm -hmm. more money to spend on entertainment and, and things. And so there's more of a relaxation. There's less of a pressure to get it right, you know, not fuck it up. You only have 10 minutes, so the, you might only spend it with someone who you think is perfect, kind of, <laughs> you know. It's okay to get it wrong and play around and meet people, which I think it gets less and less likely um, the more pressure there is in terms of how stressed you are. For example, big cities versus, versus little villages. I, mm. I have a feeling that there might be a correlation. Well, anyway, I, th I hope I'm making myself kind no, of clear. No, no, I get it. Like the, 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 the kind of life that we're leading, if we don't have much time to spend on ourselves and the things that are fun, then it becomes like, oh, I better up optimize optimize this whole thing. And that includes then it's got to be the right guy. It's got to be the right woman or what's the point? which starts raising the, the, bar, the bar of expectations ridiculously high. Um, and then you have all these check boxes and you, again, you're killing the spontaneity possibility of discovering that someone who doesn't look like anything you thought you wanted, you fucking love them. Yeah. Jamie had a great checklist that was just about impossible to, um, to fulfill. Like <laughs> must, um, like preferably we got a bit of shared background, but obviously should be a bit of like a rootless cosmopolitan, like, uh, like he is definitely has to be into Battlestar Galactica has to like, um, Star Trek. Um, but also has to be really buff, but like, um, not these, like a dumb muscle guy should be smart. Um, doesn't want to stay in one place the whole time. Um, like quite a long specific list. He's Did like, you hit all of them? and he's like, I'm never going to meet that guy. He and you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's me. It's specifically me. <laughs> uh, he, I wonder if there's an internalized worry that if he fucks it up, then he's ruined forever. Forever. Cause he'll never find me. <laughs> I, I mean, to, to, to be fair, like for context, he didn't have like a list, like the guy has to be this. It was more that he wasn't in a spot where he These wanted, are the things he, I like. Yeah. He, he wasn't in a spot where he actively like wanted a boyfriend. He was just like, be open to it. Like if it was like, like fucking awesome like this but otherwise they're like hello <laughs> you're fit <laughs> let's pivot back to consent because there was something that i was trying to say i had in my mind earlier but i forgot now Ooh, i keep knocking my microphone yeah you're a spam it's, it's like pointier so it's, it's coming closer to, anyway uh i was gonna say oh yeah so sometimes consent is hard because the other person doesn't understand the influence and power that they have, which means that you that the other person is put in a position where they can't verbally non consent, but they don't want what's happening to them. Okay. And there's examples of this. So for example, the most famous Me Too case, Harvey Weinstein, mm -hmm. he intentionally knew and used his power to threaten uh, starlets to never work again unless they did bad, you know, like, like the things that he wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's intentionally using your power to get sex that the other person doesn't want. But one of the other cases that I thought was quite interesting was Louis C.K. He kept asking, you know, other com like comedians and people in the industry whether or not he could masturbate in front of them. Mm -hmm. To which the answer that they would have given if it was, you know, their co-worker Barry at the cubicle was like, fuck you, I'm going to HR. Mm -hmm. But actually, maybe not, maybe because it's in a co-working space. If, if it's, you know, a guy on the bus, you might get up and leave. Yeah. But because it's someone with influence and power in your industry that could destroy your career if you said no, if you and maybe them. it's your hero and you're thinking, is this really happening to me? What do mm -hmm. I say? Surreal. It's, you don't know what to do. You don't like, you don't want to, you don't want to say yes, but like you also fear, fear the consequences or what could happen if you said no. Mm -hmm. And there was, therefore a lot of these women didn't say no. And so Louis CK happily jacked off in front of them. And from what I can tell, I could be wrong. But from what I can tell, he didn't realize that he was doing anything wrong. Well, it's sort of like a blindness. Like he, he, he wanted to believe that they really meant, yeah, fine. Like not picking up on the rigidity of the body, not picking up on the startled kind of confused expression because you wanted to hear yes. Yeah. And you're like, well, I heard yes, so I guess it's fine. Another example like that that I really like is from a show that I that I, I'm quite fond of. I think it's still on Netflix called Lie to Me, which mm -hmm. is uh, a series based on the, I think it's Paul Ekman. 
mm -hmm. uh, micro expressions research, mm -hmm. and which is it Tim Roth, I think, plays this guy that can read micro expressions and figure out if you're lying or not, and that kind of thing. And one of the cases, and he acts as a detective or like a consultant for the FBI and police mm -hmm. and so on. Not the, the Jerry Springer. No, and there's this rape case in the military, okay, mm -hmm. where this person, this woman was raped and said that she was raped and the other guy said no it was consensual and they finally figure out that he was her commanding officer and uh, normally you'd rotate people through the most dangerous position in sort of little envoys going through mm -hmm. Afghanistan or Iraq or something but the m only so far as she was um, con appeared to be consenting towards his advances. He would like basically protect her life by not putting her in dangerous situations, mm -hmm. and he would punish her, not necessarily knowing that that's what he was doing, but because he like oh fuck her then, by putting her in positions where she could lose her life whenever she pulled away or said no. Hmm. And so in you, the point was that someone in that position cannot consent. Like, the, yeah. the, 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 I mean, they could, but... I see this in when, uh, uh, in a, like, teacher-student setting situation. And I was pretty surprised to discover, like, some older male, uh, like, uh, university lecturers and so on strongly disagreed with me. I was like, for real? But strongly disagreed with my position, which is, no, you cannot be having a relationship or sex with someone you were teaching and have a position of responsibility and care over and you are the ones like marking their papers and giving them grades. You cannot do that because whilst you might be turned on by the power, the power dynamic, there's no way in which this can be like acceptable, healthy and neutral, especially for the student. They're going to be worried also about their grades. They're wondering if they're going to get better ones, less good ones. Yeah. You had this like idealized, like distinct person because you're in this position of teaching power and authority over them. And I had these old professors going, oh, no, I know lots of people who married their students. It's perfectly fine, perfectly normal. You need to understand the heart knows no boundaries. And like, okay, first of all, you're, you're a fat, pervy fuck. Second... You can be a fat, pervy fuck or a thin, sexy, pervy fuck. But you don't bang your student. You change the situation. If you're going to have this thing, if it's real, if it leads to like a lifelong marriage, fantastic. But not whilst you're in this asymmetrical power relation situation. Yeah, because if the other person changes their mind, they might not be able to say it out loud in fear of their entire life going down the toilet if you fail them or get them expelled. And that's how it could appear. You know, it could appear like this sort of very dramatic picture for them. And just because it can work that two people who meet in that sort of situation can have a fantastic relationship, it doesn't make it okay in that, you know, balanced way uh, in terms of the, the power relations unless you change something about that power relation. So you're like, okay, I don't teach you anymore. Or you wait until they finish the course and then you're like, would you like to go for a drink? Something like that. How long have we been talking for? This kind We've of been walk? talking for 53 minutes. Okay, that's fine. I thought it was somehow yeah. like I'm in a very hot room, ranting. <laughs> hot as balls. It's hard balls to know. Um, so I had another little story to tell, didn't okay. I? Although, do, how does it tie in, I guess? It's more, again, the difficulty of saying no, but... Well, okay, so that reminds me what I was going to say. There is a difficulty in saying no that I hope we've talked about here, and there's a difficulty in saying yes. It can be challenging to allow yourself to say, yeah, I want this. And I think I found myself in this situation I'll describe caught in the middle of both. So I had a massage recently, <laughs> and with someone that... Uh, first time for me, but someone I, I knew had gone there before and had been recommended by a friend. So I was like, okay, totally normal situation. That massage ended up with a happy ending. This is not a Thai massage place. This is this is like a proper, highly rated, highly Google ranked like physiotherapy type. physiotherapist. Yeah. A physiotherapist who like treats sports teams and stuff. <laughs> now... <laughs> 
And it's so It's like surreal. getting a happy ending from your GP. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> it's not, at least, you know, he wasn't unattractive. But yeah, so it's sort of, like, to be brief, sort of like built up in a series of like me wondering, is this really happening? Because it was, the work needed to be done like deep in my hip and early on when everything was totally professional, it was just like, okay, it can be easier. Like if you, you know, we just cover you with a towel rather than having like shorts on, are you okay with that? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm not, don't have a problem with being naked. And then gradually there was just ever more sort of penis brushing as the hand goes by. And I'm like, oh, okay, yes, but it's gonna happen. You know, it's got to hang somewhere, okay. Then as more time went on, it sort of seemed to happen quite consistently. I was like, okay, like I can tell this guy's gay. Maybe he's kind of getting off on this and whatever, more power to him. Why he can have a fun experience if he wants to, it's not, not a big deal to me. And then it kind of gets it further on where I'm like stuck in this place where I'm like, I really kind of want this to happen I really, basically I was stuck wondering, is this happening or is it not? There's two parallel realities going side by side. One where it's all just happenstance and that just happens, whatever. And the other where he's intentionally doing this and is trying to like initiate something. And I hate that indeterminate zone. I'm like, I want to know what it is, one way or the other. Because and, until you know, it's hard to make a choice and decide if you're consenting. Exactly. I didn't know, is it on, is it not? So I kind of, I almost but didn't say like, hey, are you just wanting to grab hold of that? because you can like then it would have been me taking the step of just like hey but then I was scared to say that was what if he said no and I'd like, be like what are you talking about and now I just <laughs> I've been a really weird freak who's like freaked out the like innocent but like str loose handed um uh massage guy so I didn't say anything and then things sort of escalated some more where he was like testing with like is this like uh, pull one leg up to your chest and have the other one straight whilst on the edge of the bed to see like the tightness of the psoas or something so now I'm very much naked rolling around on this thing and then he's like digging deep into the psoas which is very groin kind of location yeah. then another like the next patient person arrives but he's like oh they're yeah they're really early don't worry would you like some more and I'm not, at that moment I'm like I don't think they're early I don't think they're early, but he's, he's also, this is expensive treatment I can barely afford. And he's like, do you want some more? And I'm like, does he mean, do I want some more treatment? Does he mean, do I want some more? And so kind of out of like, well, more massage stuff, good. And I really want to know what the fuck is going on. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then at a certain point, like if there's enough like rubbing a massage oil, the erection becomes pretty undeniable. <laughs> And then he jacked me off and I had some trouble, like just getting out of my own head, like going, am I okay with this? I don't know. I think I am. I definitely think it's a really funny story. I'll be able to tell my friends and like, well, I also have like the sense, like how strange it is that we're fine to pay someone to relieve tension in our body, but not if it involves an orgasm, which is also like massage the body and relieve tension and have some sort of stress relief. And afterwards, he like barely said anything about it. It was just back to, okay, so the thing with your hip. It does feel like slightly predatory behavior, like advanced predatory behavior. The very slow, gradual mm. build up. Because mm. if he just set you down, took your pants off and started mashing it, <laughs> you'd have been like, what the fuck's going on? Yeah. I'm leaving. But by slowly warming you up. You know, it could be. It could be because then there's that sort of, there's so, enough doubt and confusion that like if I were to go back and said, I would say like, you know, just the massage this time, that would be clear. But there's a little bit of me that I find it weird to admit that's like, maybe you would like it to happen again. <laughs> like maybe you would like that sort of odd, ambiguous, seductive like thing to happen. I don't know. But I felt really weird about it. I still feel quite weird about it because it's, I'm not definitely not doing the thing like, I regret it, therefore it was assault. But it was very difficult to put, to definitely think, yeah, to say, no, I don't want this. Because you weren't really given a chance to I, say no. No. And then on, because he might have said, oh, do you want more? But that's so ambiguous, you don't know. And then on the other hand, 
I found it really also a challenge to find a way in which to say yes directly. The only sort of yes was the fact that once he's like tossing me off, I'm clearly, you know, getting into it to an extent. But, you know, for I'm sure I'm not alone in that if someone someone starts sucking your dick or jacking you off, you're kind of like, I did. Oh, it feels really good, though. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and then you sort of <laughs> you caught in the situation you're like, yeah, I don't know if I want this to happen. That does feel oh, fine, okay. Yeah. So That's I'm, I'm left perplexed on the in between there as to what happened. But I do realize and recognize that the power really lies with me as to whether I interpret that as a negative or a positive or just an experience. I guess it just is. It just is. For sure. One for the book. One, yeah, one for the, 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 the anal bonanza sex capades, the biography. Um, yeah, but it's it's a strange one, and it really it led me to think about this again. That dynamic of like, ah, I just want to like let myself go and be open to these cool, like unusual experiences. And Jamie thought it was hotter than I did. Because he's like, it sounds so hot. The massage guy you gave us suddenly gave you a happy ending. Ah, how exciting. And I'm like, I feel a bit more confused about it than mm-hmm. that. Oh, well, it sounds honest. hot as a story. Yeah. It's one of those things that, like, something I think people sometimes don't understand, for example, is when they allow something that was their fantasy to happen to them mm-hmm. because it's their fantasy, even though there's weird little alarm bells going off in their heads. And what you got to understand is just because you like pretending about it in your head doesn't mean you actually like doing it Mm. and it's okay to go you know what like this was hot in my head but i'm not into it at all but it's a conflict most people don't realize is possible they assume that if it's hot in your brain Mm. then surely it's also hot in reality definitely i think that's 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 a lot of that happens a lot in sex where you're just like now this doesn't really work or this is I'm gonna fuck you against the wall and you're like the wall's really abrasive and this radiator's <laughs> really in the way and I'm gonna fuck you in midair and you know shortly after if you're the one doing the fucking you're like oh my god I'm gonna die my heart is gonna explode <laughs> this is so <laughs> exhausting <laughs> some things are more hot in theory than in practice which is not to say that like like differently to what you said where you might just want to say no but it, it's possible to like enjoy something like for having done it more than right. the thing itself. Yeah. If, if that's how it feels. But if, if you feel uncomfortable and like, this is not what I want, mm. you should be able to feel comfortable with yourself enough to realize it and not have repressed it and wonder yeah. why at the end of it, you're feeling so weird and dirty. Something definitely, and- <laughs> I think that's a good point that it kind of begins with having comfort with yourself yeah. enough to be able to go, okay, I, 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 I don't want this or I do want this. Because there's like two levels of, in, of censorship going on. One, because you're not comfortable with yourself, because you're judging yourself one way or another. And then the fearfulness over what the other person's reaction is going to be. Double trouble. Mm. So I guess to wrap up, I had, I, these are not like uh, incredible life hacks or something, but I was just musing on some phrases for sort of saying no, kind of mentioned them earlier. Like, I think hey, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just not feeling this. I'm just not feeling this anymore. I think it's quite a good one where you've maybe got into a situation and you changed your mind and you'd like it to stop because I'm not feeling this anymore. It's like, yeah, I'm just, I don't have the vibe. It's not saying I don't like you or you're bad. You've done something wrong. And it's also not like fabricating some sort of problem with yourself over it you're just like yeah just just not got it don't don't feel this i think that'd probably be my favorite go-to and then if like it's the creeping hand situation i think like i really appreciate that but um i i don't really want to and some people like first of all you're a fucktard if you say this by the way why not (laughs) yeah and some people genuinely do i had this on like a, a grinder chat recently where I essentially politely said, like, yeah, yeah, I'm, but I'm, I, I'm not interested, um, th- but thank you. And he said, why not? Why am I not interested? And I'm like, what, what, what answer do you want? Do you want me to say that you've got an ugly face or something? Do you want me to say... I think you should. 
What is the possible answer? That I think that's one of the few places where radical honesty is important. Okay, tell me more. When people are forcing you to not be rude, basically to put you in a situation where you might have to recant what you're saying or just feel uncomfortable and be, like not say anything because the only option that is offered is to be rude by being truthful. Then you should reward that request for honesty by <laughs> being honest. Well, I guess what they're doing there is like a pressure flip where it's like, oh, I feel weakened because I've been rejected. So now I'm going to put you in this super awkward situation by forcing you to be rude or to lie and be evasive and just make you uncomfortable instead. So like, you know, next time someone says, why not? You'd be like, I think you're one of the ugliest men I've ever seen. <laughs> and I would feel pity for you, which is not a turn on. Jesus Christ. That, like, be, you, like, you, like, you, you know. got nuclear there. <laughs> Jesus. I said, I said nothing because mm. I thought I, I'm not going to expend my time. And like, it felt like having to spend emotional energy, to be honest, to be like, let me unpack this for you. You're asking a question, which clearly like there is no possible good answer to. The simple fact is I am not attracted to you. The reasons for that are irrelevant. The only relevant factor in this situation is I'm not into it. End. How do you take that? I didn't say anything. I didn't say that. But that's, I, I could have said that. That's all I think I would have said, but I couldn't even be asked writing it. I'm just like, you're just kind of being, uh, you're being really right. obtuse or a dick. I mean, th that's one of those situations where you shouldn't have to say anything. Yeah. Right? Because I said a, no. Because for your own personal gain, it's a waste of time. But mm. the reason why you should use brutal honesty is because it has a collective benefit of teaching an asshole through shame. Which Shame. is important for the next person that he comes along and acts like a dick to. Because a soliness reverberates through society like a wave. Reverberating asshole. It has a harmonic <laughs> frequency. <laughs> <laughs> through the bowels and the guts. Well, yeah. Have you ever noticed that if someone does something really horrible to you right in the morning, you end up being nasty back to somebody else later and it just kind of reverberates? It can happen. Like, removing that, it sh should be, I mean, without be becoming a crusade, but the but part of the problem with that action, though, that I felt is that I don't want to then... It is kind of an assholey or certainly rude thing to do, to do this correcting. And I see the bigger picture that you're saying, okay, it could have positive consequences. But then that person's going to feel like you attack them and you are an asshole and set off their own chain of negative repercussions. Maybe, but if you're... If you're... Sorry, the trick is to be brutal, not mean. Mm-hmm be as brutally so honest as possible without being insulting. It's not about an insult. An insult isn't justified. If you tell someone you're an arrogant prick because they are, that's not rude. That's not, you know, like... It, I, it, would, I would add a bit of language. I would say, I think you're an arrogant prick. Right. It's like, this is my opinion of you. Yeah, well, in this case, it's I find you ugly as sin, not you are as ugly right. as sin. Uh, I was going to go for, like, the why not answer could be, like, I'm not attracted to you. I mean, I could say, yeah, That's a nicer way. or you could say like, well, then he go, why not? I'm just not, fe I'm just not. Fe <laughs> well, what kind of, I can't get over the madness of the question. Cause I'm just like, well, are you unable to do just a little bit of thinking? You know what? Why don't, why not? What reason? Like, mm. is it that everyone else in your life that you've wanted to sleep with has wanted to sleep with you that you're just bamboozled <laughs> by this response of no, thanks. Maybe. He didn't... I can't imagine why unless he was like outrageously rich and everyone had felt compelled. <laughs> was it Harvey Weinstein? Was he talking to me on Grindr? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Funny stuff. So it's a difficult topic because there's just so many different avenues to talk about. Yeah. Hard to say yes, hard to say no. Hard to know if the other person's saying yes or no. Like in... Although I think it's good that we've given we some air time. We only kind of barely... Tapped it, I think. Tapped it. <laughs> so I think it's good that we gave some airtime to the difficulty of saying yes, because I don't think that that's spoken about too much in general. Mm. So uh, please get in touch and let us know what you think, everybody. Especially if you've got anything we, you'd like us to expand on, because I feel we've got another probably two hours worth of conversation if we wanted to. I think we could, and I think it'd be really good to um, bring in uh, some other people to talk to. I never quite women. like it. Well, women. You talk to women. Basically, I was going to say that, but at the same time, I don't like it. The setup where it's like you need to have like 
token people of all, all sorts. But but the female no. experience, there's a lot of things it is in slightly common different. between them. Yeah. It was partly an LSD trip that made oh. me sort of go, oh, I don't know what it's like to be surrounded by people that want to get in my pants and are between 30 to 50% stronger than I am at all times. Yeah. I can never realize what that is No, like. no, we fucking can't. And I've been super, like, discovered I was super naive when hearing just from female friends like I, I heard some stories and I was saying, oh yeah, I'm, as, a, as a woman, I'm always being like groped in clubs or on the subway or whatever. And I was like, okay, female friends, does this really happen? And they're mm. all like, yes, of course it does. I genuinely didn't know. That was another hashtag that I thought that for me was important to be reminded of. There was a hashtag called yes, every woman. And some men got super defensive about it. It started a, like a meninist versus feminist type of debate. <laughs> yeah, I hate that word. Um, but the point wasn't that all men are evil, which is what idiots extrapolate. Just any man. No, but all you need is like 1% of the population to be the gropey kind. Mm -hmm. And it could easily happen to all women. Hmm. And it's interesting that very few women have not experienced any form of inappropriate behavior or assault by the time they're in their 30s. Mm -hmm. And that, that hashtag was there to try and explain to men who cannot experience that unless they suddenly become a woman. Well, I hope that by having a longer conversation, we've managed to do a bit more than just give you a hashtag to throw around and put in your <laughs> pipe. Um, yeah, it would definitely be good to speak to uh, these female creatures that we've been talking about. No, it's, what I was trying to say before mm. is like the, the tokenism thing can be shitty because it's yeah. not like, oh, tell me the view of all women because you're a woman. Right. But at the same time, it, we simply don't have access to these very common experiences among women. So practically any woman would do <laughs> to talk to. <laughs> but we will de definitely try and speak uh, to someone who's fun and interesting and who can shed some light on this. I mean, it would have been cool to have heard Carsey Blanton talk some more on this um, as well. Go check out our episode with Carsey about uh, being open in sex and relationships world. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of out of gas. So can we consent to end <laughs> this podcast? Um, if, you, well, if you if you want. <laughs> No, I, I can't make the joke, sorry. <laughs> if, if you like what we do, if you think uh, this is adding some value to you, um, it would be awesome and mean a lot to us if you could help us out with a few bucks on Patreon to help pay for the various expenses of the podcast and my forthcoming unemployment. Allow us to, to, allow us to be able to afford to say no to our Johns if we want to. Yeah. <laughs> is that me? <laughs> I'm not the, just okay. Well, it's a slang for. I know. <laughs> and I have to live with that. <laughs> so that's patreon.com slash V in the D. But uh, even if you're not uh, contributing directly on there, you're contributing to the show by listening to it. And we really appreciate that. And we really appreciate you. So till next time, everybody, please be silly, be kind and be weird.